Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. What a great problem to have. <laughs> I'd just like to welcome you to the Nina Historical Society's regular program night. We like to celebrate Nina's history, and that's what we'll be doing tonight. I'd like to give a special shout out and thank you to Nick Jebney of the Menasha Historical Society. He's been filming our programs the last few months, and we're really grateful for that. We can capture our Nina stories on film, and soon they will be up on our website. So if you miss a program, you'll be able to check it out on our website. Um, we have uh, next month's program is March 16th. Or no, that's today. <laughs> Uh, April 20th, our program will be Life in Nina's Progressive Era by Professor Steve Sheehan. He's a member of our board and we're working together, we've worked together to write our upcoming exhibit, which is called Making a Hometown, Life in Nina's Progressive Era. It's such a fascinating story to learn about that time period in Nina and all that was going on. And the things that took place then are still in place now and we're still benefiting from them. So it's a lot, it's been just so much fun to learn about what was going on in the progressive era. We'll learn a little bit more about that from Steve next month. Our annual meeting is coming up. Uh, that will be May 11th. If you're a member of the Historical Society and you'd like to come to our annual meeting, please join us for that. Professor Jonathan Kasparik will be speaking on the Wisconsin idea and its foundational history in Wisconsin and also as it ties to our um, upcoming exhibit in the Progressive Era because that's when the Wisconsin idea started. If you would like to join the, his the Historical Society, we have membership forms on the side table. We also have some books for sale and just some other information for you. Feel free to grab that. And I'm not going to hold this up any longer. I'm going to introduce Tim Galloway and Jim Reiser. I am so thrilled that they're here and I know that you are too. They are a wonderful part of our community and part of what makes this such a great hometown. So please help me welcome them. Well, Jim and I want to thank you so much for all being here. And uh, given the size of the crowd, Jim and I just made a pact. We're committed to getting you out of here in three hours. It'll be the best three hours that you've ever spent. Um, be, before we get started, I do have some people in my corner, because you always have to have people in your corner. And I have my much better half. Um, Steve Lindgren, my wife of over 30 years. I have my indomitable mother here, Peg Galloway, and I have the birthday boy, Pat Galloway. Uh, so, and Jim's wife, Chris, Christine, is, is back there. So, welcome all. So without further ado, we will get started. I, I told Jim we were going to start off with uh, Hans and Franz, and he said maybe some people won't get that, so we <laughs> want to maybe bing and bob, but uh, we're going to get right into the program. Uh, I'm going to start. I'm older than Jim. <laughs> My husband's older than Jim, so I got first draw. Um, actually, the Galloway family uh, dairied, uh, had a very large working farm in the Fond du Lac area way back uh, from the 1860s. Uh, my grandfather, who started Galloway Company, actually uh, was a champion breeder of brown Swiss cattle. And he went to the New York's World Fair with uh, Pretty Jane and won an award. Um, so that, uh, that is part of our, of our history. Um, actually, the Galloway family, our first processing facility was in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. It was called Galloway West. The West was the other family who was co-owner of the business. And this is what dairying was like back then. Milk came in and cans from the farm and went on these steak trucks and was brought into the dairy. Um, we owned that dairy until 1929. It was then sold to the Borden Company with the proviso the name stays Galloway West. And the Bordens said, yeah, but we're the Bordens. And we said, yeah, that's why the name's going to be Galloway West. <laughs> um, my grandfather continued to work at Galloway West uh, until he retired in about 1944. And uh, 
Uh, but in the meantime, he had bought an interest in a little dairy in Nina, Wisconsin. The West family bought an interest first. They convinced Grandpa to invest in it. And uh, actually, that dairy started out as the George Dankey Company. And the location was where the Boys and Girls Brigade is right now. Uh, but in, uh, that was found in 1927. They outgrew that facility rapidly. So by 1928, they built a dairy on South Commercial Street. I think that's because that was out of town. <laughs> um, so in 1932, my grandfather uh, invested in uh, Danke uh, Dairy. That name was changed. Uh, there were some financial uh, difficulties with the firm. The name was changed to Nina Milk Products. If you would read the who's who, the board of directors of Nina Milk Products from back in the 1930s, there were some lesser lights, the Kimberleys, the Shattucks, <laughs> the Krugers, the Pickers. Everyone invested in this little dinky dairy. <laughs> Not quite sure why. Um, and then finally by 1956, our family had become sole owners uh, and changed the name. This is what Nina Milk Products looked like when we first moved to Commercial Street. The guts is still there, behind a lot of tanks, behind some other facades and that. But parts of that uh, building are still uh, in existence. Uh, because we were selling products nationwide back then, really not uh, west of the uh, Rockies, but uh, most of our customers were never going to come to Nina, Wisconsin to visit. So back then it seemed important to put our picture on the letterhead and so you can see the progression as the company moved along and grew. Uh, we added uh, more and more. Uh, the one in the bottom, uh, actually that is, I think that was uh, drawn by my sister Meg um, at one time. She drew one of our letterheads. Uh, you can see that uh, that was the old days because the phone numbers <laughs> are just five digits. <laughs> um, a lot of you remember, uh, uh, who have been around a while, that uh, yeah, uh, Nina Milk Products actually had a dairy store connected to it. So this is looking south from over where NERCON is now. And the dairy store is the little building in front. And uh, you could walk in if you didn't get the door to door, or if you missed your delivery or whatever, you could go in and buy your products. And here was a display case in the store and it's just some of the products that were available at the time. Um, we were a full door-to-door -door <laughs> delivery dairy, so we had the fluid milk, cottage cheese, all that kind of stuff, cream, uh, but we also had our industrial products displayed in the case. Um, those little trucks that are lined up in front, those replaced the old carriages but you went out to the farms and picked up cans of milk. And out in front of the plant, there were these big iron racks, and the cans went in front. I feel so sorry for the people who lived across the street. <laughs> because when the cans are back up on the track and they couldn't go anywhere, they just boom, boom, boom. Um, so that is the early history of Galloway Company. And it's now time to turn it over to the much more handsome Jim Reiser. <laughs> he always was kind. Uh, one of my one of my friends that uh, said, "Hey Jim, if you ever speak, you know, a little humor usually softens up the the group." And uh, so these are real quick G-rated. Okay. How do you make a dinosaur float? Two scoops of ice cream. <laughs> These are rated G. <laughs> what do you get from an Alaskan cow? Alaskan milk. Ice, ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> How do mathematics, pardon me, mathematicians eat ice cream? That's pretty good. But they use a cone. <laughs> Bert and Ernie joke. Bert, do you want any ice cream, Ernie? Ernie answers, 
Sure, Bert. <laughs> Johnny Carson would say, this is a good crowd tonight. Yeah. That's how he found out, so thank you. Um, I'm really proud to be here and uh, represent uh, Nina Dairy Queen um, because I didn't start this. I just happened to be one of the uh, lucky people uh, that uh, got to continue on in uh, Nina Dairy Queen. And, uh, I was blessed to be in the ice cream business, and that's why I wanted to do this. So uh, what I'm going to do is I, I want to um, take you back on it and let you know about the relationships. I think the most important thing about Nina Dairy Queen and where I am today is because of the relationships. Man, you can hear the, hear the heart up in my voice, can't you? <laughs> I can. Um, but I want to take you up, and I want, I want you to, to understand the importance of that relationships, and then we're going to finalize that uh, at the end. So what I have to do is I have to take you on a journey. People have always asked, how'd you get here, Jim? I don't recall being in high school with your parents. And Tim said they came over on a boat. Uh, yeah, they came over from uh, Calumet County, basically. So I'm, I'm going to start. Um, and my, my start is 1959 to 1964. But I'm going to take you back on my, my parents' journey. And I have to read because I have so many points, and I really do want to get you out of here. So I'm going to try to stick to this format. Archie and Betty were married in 1946. They both grew up on a dairy farm. They bought 80 acres of land with a farm at and started their first business venture. In 1958, Archie and Betty, um, or pardon me, Archie had his second back surgery and it was suggested that he move off the farm. In the fall of 59, they bought, they went to Dairy Queen, they went to Green Bay and bought the Dairy Queen on Main and Irwin Street. They opened that store in the uh, spring of 59. Archie and Betty both worked at the store, dad all day and night, and mom helped out during the day. We lived two blocks down the road from Dairy Queen. I remember walking dad's dinner down to him in the evening. Mm -hmm. I remember my parents being a real team. Mom was a great cheerleader for dad. Dad worked a lot, and the hours in the winter he worked at Schmidt Wholesale because they were closed in the winter. It was at this time that the Riser Galloway relationship started. They were the supply company for the Dairy Queen in the mix industry. During the next five years, Mom and Dad made many relationships with other Dairy Queen owners and suppliers. They would gather for regional meetings and national conventions. Archie, with his love of people, would talk to and welcome everybody. In 1964, Archie needed to have his third back surgery. It was uh, a brand new procedure, and he had to go to Mayo Clinic to have it done. So, Mom drove him over to Minnesota, and guess who drove him back? They needed a station wagon because he had to be flat on his back. So. The Galloway Company came to the rescue. They had a salesman named Clarence Gorgas who drove a station wagon. So he came over, picked Dad up, and brought him back to Green Bay. Um, Archie was going to need recovery for six weeks, so again, he had to sell his second business venture. Thank you, Jim. So, and of course, that is a picture of Archie and Betty in the Green Bay store. So in 1956, uh, Nina Milk Products officially became Galloway Company. Um, and these are the founders of Galloway Company. Um, seated is my grandfather, Ed. Um, standing in the upper left is Richard Galloway, Dick Galloway, uh, who just left us this past fall. Standing next to him is my uncle Ned Galloway, and he passed away a few years ago. And then my dad John, who also passed away one week after Uncle Dick, um, this fall is standing in the upper right. You know, 93 is a good long life. 94. 
<laughs> Even better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the mind is the first goal. Um, so we were a door-to-door -door dairy, as I indicated earlier. Some of you may be old enough to remember the old Defco trucks that ran up and down the road. The guy would drive it standing up. He'd sort of leave it in idle, would run with a, with a basket of, of goods. He'd put in what you marked down and what you needed. Sometimes there'd be money in there. Most of the time there wasn't run back to the truck and he'd go back and forth up and down the streets. Um, <clears throat> connection with Dairy Queen. Uh, when Dairy Queen was first um, started, it was not allowed to be sold in the state of Wisconsin. The state of Wisconsin had a law that ice cream mixes had to be 10% butter fat or more. Dairy Queen, can I give out the secret, Jim? It's 5%. <laughs> <laughs> you gave me the sign. Uh, Five percent. And so it was not allowed to be sold. And my dad went down to the state capitol and lobbied and lobbied and lobbied and finally got ice milks to be approved for sale in the state of Wisconsin. Um, however, this did not sit well with some of our customer base. We sold to lots of people. We sold to lots of custard stands in particular. And they wanted to protect their customer base. So. They didn't want a truck that stopped at a Dairy Queen to also stop at the custard stand, because we're not going to be one of those inferior <laughs> type products. So Galloway Company actually ran a semi to all of our Dairy Queens with a Dairy Queen logo on it. And uh, that kept some peace in the customer base. Um, now, uh, let's see, what else can I say about the time? We, we were in door-to-door -door dairy until about 67, 68. And uh, at that time is when the convenience stores, the gas stations, the grocery stores, it was a terrible business. It was 100% of your headaches. It was 110% of your loss because it was a cash business and a lot of times the cash wasn't there. And it was we were just amazed that someone paid us money to get out of the business. <laughs> okay, so I ended with mom and dad in 64 in Green Bay. So it's titled 66 to 78. So Archie was a food salesman and he wanted to get back in the, biz in the milk business. He wanted to get back into Dairy Queen. On his sales trips through Nina, he would stop and talk to Lenny Mathias, the owner of the Dairy Queen. During Dad's Dairy Queen years, he became good friends with Lenny. They talked about Archie getting back into the Dairy Queen business, and in 1966, Mom and Dad bought the Nina Dairy Queen. So Dad contacted the Galloways and said, I'd be coming to town, I bought the Dairy Queen. But I don't have a place for my family. There aren't very many homes for sale in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. So John and Clarence said, well, we'll see what we can do for you. The phone rang the next day, and they found out that uh, their accountant had built a home and his house was available. So there we were in February of 66. We moved to the uh, city of Menasha on the island. Let's talk about, I gotta go back now, I gotta go back to 1946, okay? And the reason I have to go back there is that's when Dairy Queen actually started, okay? So you heard Kim's story about there weren't any Dairy Queens in Wisconsin because they couldn't sell ice milk. Ice milk, what was that? That was one of the questions we always had as a kid. Because that my when my dad got in business, my dad's a dairy farmer. My whole family, from my mom's side, is all dairy farms. Well, if it isn't ice, ice cream, then what the heck is in this stuff? <laughs> it just had less butter fat, which was the, the hang-up, and that's why the industry wanted to be called ice milk, something less than. They didn't want to be called ice cream. So nothing changed. It was just a mindset that the industry wanted us to have. So in 1946, 
they had a, a, a freezer, a machine that made um, ice cream. And that uh, led to a Dairy Queen freezer agreement. If you had this agreement, you could sell this soft serve product, this ice melt product. But you, you, couldn't, um, you couldn't call it ice cream at the time. So in 1946, Albert Mathias signs a freezer agreement that would uh, that that he signed. When he signed that, they came over and they told uh, Mr. Mathias at that time, "You have to take your popcorn, you have to take your hot food, and you have to get it out of here." Albert looked at them and said, "Why don't you take your freezer agreement and why don't you leave?" <laughs> And, that, and that's a quote from uh, Lenny. I never got to, to uh, meet Albert. Okay? So that was, that was part of that start. So um, in 1947, this is the part I think is pretty cool. In 1947, the 100th Dairy Queen franchise agreement was signed. So Nina's in the top 100. There's 6,000 Dairy Queens out there now. So I think that's a pretty cool number for us. So why, why couldn't we be called Dairy Queen yet? The Merlin Leapside family owned the trademark for Dairy Queen in the state of Wisconsin. Dairy Queen was milk, not ice cream. It was in a glass jar, kind of like what the Galloway Company delivered every day to people's homes. The, in 1951, the Leapside family opened the first Dairy Queen in Wisconsin, and that's the one on Oneida Street. In 1952, the paperwork came through, and all Wisconsin uh, freezer agreements now became Dairy Queen contracts, so now we could all use the word Dairy Queen. Who and where built the first Dairy Queen machines? Wisconsin, Keel, Wisconsin, Stolting Company. Um, we're making an investment. We'll talk a little bit about that. We're getting new stolting equipment for you. Who helped develop the formula? And this is one of the things um, John Galloway had. If he was here, he could probably literally talk hours just on that subject about, uh, about the Dairy Queen. So I, I'm just putting him in there because that's part of my relationship. In 1953, Lenny and Jeanette bought the rights from his dad, Albert. In 1957, the move from the Valley Queen location to the 450 South Commercial Street. So Valley Queen, right here, was on the site that the Winnebago County Social Service Building is on. So in the old days, you know, across from Hesse Rolls, you know, it was there. And this is the original store, and like what Kim was saying, if you go past that store, that shell is also underneath that new blue building that's there. Okay. In 1966, Archie and Betty bought the rights and the territory to the uh, NIA DQ. Steve Mathias stayed on working for mom and dad. That was Lenny's uh, youngest son. In 1968, Scott Galloway came on board. That's Tim's older brother. Then brother Tim joined the staff in 1970 and became one of the lead shutdown people at the store. Hey Jim, the hats still don't fit. <laughs> Mine always fell off. <laughs> the dilly wagon was a big part. Somebody even asked about that. So the dilly wagon was a big part of our community. And uh, so that was part of the 60s. Lenny had, a, had the dilly wagon. When we moved, we ran the dilly wagon for four more years. And then in 1970, when, when Archie, my dad, had his first heart attack, guess what mom sold? <laughs> the dilly wagon went away. In 1974, the red roof and the entryway were put uh, on the Dairy Queen. Also in 1978, Dairy Queen had an expansion. Uh, the Gate and Gillingham store were added to the community. It was built by uh, my sister and her husband, Terry, 
It was called Terry's Dairy Queen. It was the first restaurant in the community to have a drive through restaurant. I have a little trivia question. What did I do with those blizzard coins? <laughs> While I'm getting that, there's somebody in this room, and if somebody can answer this question, I'll give you a blizzard coin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the quote is, Archie makes the best old-fashioned lime sodas. Who said that in this room? That's a person's quote in this room. Peg, don't say a word. No. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it was Peg. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have enough for everybody, but I thought we'd better get rolling on that one. But I even went to Dad and I said, hey, Dad, what's, what's the secret to making Peg's old-fashioned soda special? And I told Peg, I, I found out Dad's secret. She said, I don't care, your father makes the best live <laughs> old-fashioned sodas. So Galloway Company also continued to grow, just like uh, Jim and his family continued to reinvest in their business um, to try and uh, uh, keep their market share and, and grow the business. Galloway Company did the same. So uh, you may remember that uh, in the old days, the offices were actually in a house located just south of the current property. It's probably about where the big, really ugly, gray cooler building is. <laughs> um, uh, we'll never do another one like that. Uh, and uh, But that's where the offices were. But eventually we joined the modern era and uh, probably in the mid-60s we put up uh, an addition where the double garage doors were and the offices like many good dairies are located above a processing area because if you need more space, just kick the office people out. <laughs> um, we continued to add tanks. This also lovely uh, addition that my Uncle Ned put on, we were so landlocked for space because remember it was a through railroad at the time that we actually had to build above the sidewalk. And that's full of tanks. Um, in the 1980s, the third generation of the Galloway family joined the business. Um, so that picture represents, uh, that's not how we looked in the 1980s, believe me. Um, Patrick had hair, Patrick's in the lower uh, uh, left-hand corner, and he joined in about 86, 87, something like that. Uh, I joined in 1980, cousin Todd had been there since 79, uh, uh, cousin Jeff, uh, Todd's brother, who works in the factory, had been there for a fair bit longer than that. And uh, brother Ted is uh, also joined in 1979. Uh, we worked for the three brothers. Uncle Dick uh, had to retire for medical reasons in the mid-80s, uh, and he was our president at the time. My father John, who had always been a salesman, took over uh, as president until he retired. Uh, and then uh, Uncle Ned also worked until just about the same time that John retired. Curiously, Ned was our head engineer. His son is our head engineer. John was a salesman. His three sons are salesmen. <laughs> the apple does not fall far from the tree. Um, but by 1990, uh, uh, or 1988, uh, the second generation announced that they were going to retire. And the business was ours to win or lose. I think if there was a gift that my dad and my uncles gave us, is when they left, they said, you've got our phone number. We don't want an office. We just need a mail slot, because we're still going to continue to get mail. Call us if you need us. And if you don't need us, run it well. I've seen so many family businesses where the, uh, where the generation ahead stays on way too long and doesn't give the uh, next generation the room to grow. 
Well, we made a decision in 1988, and that's to bet the farm. Uh, we spent uh, close to $4 million to put up the world's state-of-the-art evaporator to make sweet and condensed milk. And uh, that has turned out to be one of our best investments ever. Um, so, some of you probably don't know what goes on in that building. <laughs> you know now that we make ice cream. So, real quickly, here are the products that Galloway Company makes. We make sweet and condensed milk, and we make a lot of it. Um, not the stuff you find in cans. Most of it goes out in 48,000 pound tank trucks. Some of it goes out in totes, drums, or pails. Um, we make beverage bases. We make acidified beverage bases and alcoholic beverage bases. We make bases for cream liqueurs. Um, we make specialty milks, evaporated milk, concentrated milk, and we do dairy dessert mixes and bases as we talked about. Um, the sweet condensed milk goes into candy, you know, confectionery. Uh, it goes into beverage toppings. You know, if you've been to Jim's store and you have a mulatte, right? And you have a little drizzle of caramel or hot fudge on top of the whipped cream. That base, that probably started out right here in Eno, Wisconsin. And there isn't a whole lot of drizzle on that whipped cream. But if you take mulattes, and what they serve at Mickey D's and Starbucks, and you add all that up, that's a lot of little drizzles. <laughs> um, bakeries and pies, notably our friends, uh, um, the Edwards pies made by Schwann's, and it's not just the key lime, it's all sorts of frozen uh, uh, dairy pies. 100% of that comes from Nina, Wisconsin, of the dairy, of the sweet condensed milk that goes in that pie, comes from Nina, Wisconsin. Uh, Hershey uh, hot fudge and uh, the, the, the good stuff in the glass jars, not the squeeze bottle. 100% um, comes from Nina, Wisconsin. And all sorts of candies. And then ice cream toppings and variegates. Jim uses um, a lot of his toppings from one of our best customers, uh, right down in Milwaukee. But we sell to all the major topping companies in the United States. Um, and then dairy dessert mixes, ice cream, uh, custard, which has a little bit different standard of identity, gelatos, sorbets, and now the good news is that Jim's is an ice cream. It's no longer an ice milk. It's not. <laughs> you want to talk about that? Um, yeah, we, we worked hard because this this was obviously discriminatory, and it was. Well, you know, we weren't able to buy margarine in Wisconsin for a long time, or imitation cheese and things like that. Well, we finally got through the fact that this is ice cream, it's just a different version. It's like there's milk, and then there's 2% milk, and 1% milk, and skim milk, it's all milk. So now we have ice cream, reduced fat ice cream, light ice cream, and no fat ice cream. And the world is safe. <laughs> we make acidified dairy uh, bases. Uh, this is a real trick. You all know what happens when you add acid and milk. Uh, we invested in technology in the late or in the mid 90s with a company in Holland who taught us how to add acid to dairy and not make a curdle. And that led us to go into the late lamented whippersnapple, um, Sobe drinks, fuse. We actually are now in a rock star drink that's doing very well in multiple flavors of that. And then the dirty little secret, because I remember my grandfather telling my dad that, boys, you, you may never get rich in the dairy business, but at least it's a good, honest business. It's not like selling cigarettes or alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> All right, never mind. <laughs> um, so what, uh, part of that technology was also to learn how to manufacture cream liqueur bases. And we struggled with that for a long time. We built a $5 million addition onto our building to try and do all this. And we didn't sell any alcohol for a long time. But now it's a good part of our business, a growing part, and um, those are just some of the brand names that our product goes into. Um, 
and it's a, it's, it's a great business for us. So I'll show you a picture later, but uh, we'll get into that. Here are just some quick facts. We're third generation owned and uh, operated. Um, 93 total employees, 51 production and maintenance. We run 24-7, 365 with that few employees. And we're the largest in the country in most everything we do. It's a highly automated business. Um, uh, 122,000 square feet. We use over 3 million pounds of Wisconsin local farm milk annually, plus a whole lot of other milk from other sources. Um, we use about 45 million pounds of sugar a year. Um, we're the largest <coughs> manufacturer of sweet and condensed milk in the country for further food and beverage processing. We're the largest dairy dessert manufacturer in Wisconsin. Okay, we're the only one. <laughs> um, but we have sales in over 38 states, and that is growing rapidly with one of our largest customers. And we are the leading manufacturer of dairy, beverage bases, acidified, and alcoholic in the world. Um, I'm going to do this real quick because I don't tend to want to bore you with the mission except for two things. This next one, to provide meaningful employment. I don't know many people who have that in their mission statement. It's very important for us that the employees who come to work, work each day feel as valued as the employees that Jim has because that's one of his mottos too. And to give back to the community. That's in our mission statement. Not to make profit, not to do other things. It is to give back to the community and provide meaningful employment. And in the vision, we want to be the supplier of choice. We're committed to being at the best. And we want our employees to feel it's a great place to work. That's in our vision. And then values, we've got lots of them. The one I'll highlight is the one nimble. I think that's what's made our company where it is today. People pitch in and get the job done. And it happens at Dairy Queen because I work there. And I know other people who've worked there. And that's what happens at Dairy Queen as well. It's not just, oh, I make dillies. I do a lot of stuff. <laughs> Jim? See why I wanted him to be a part of this? <laughs> OK, so in uh, uh, at this time period, uh, I left Dairy Queen. And I was not working for mom and dad at that time. Who said shame? <laughs> Give him a blizzard coin. In 1980, I got a call. It was exciting and scary. It was mom and dad. Dad said they want to sell the Dairy Queen, and they wanted to know if we wanted to buy it. So guess who I had to go to? <laughs> Christine. We said yes. It was my dream job. We were only married for four years. We had two little boys. It was the family business, and what if I screwed up? Um, I had told Christine that it was my dream job, and I'm hoping that maybe we can get into business in the next 10 years. So that's why it was kind of scary. I mean, we were young and naive. We were kids. Yes, yeah, somebody said kids over here. Yes, we were, we were kids, truly kids. We made no announcements about this. We wanted no communication to the, uh, I should say I wanted no communication to the community that uh, management change had happened. I was, I was scared. I really was scared of the fact that what would people think of me? You know, when, when your dad is Archie <laughs> and your name is just Jim, <laughs> you know, who's Dairy Queen would you rather go to? <laughs> so we left at Archie's Dairy Queen. In 1985, we put the addition on the store, which allowed us to go year round. We still get calls to this day, don't we, Amy? Are you open for the season yet? <laughs> we still get those. So 
we still haven't gotten the word out. But part of our mission statement, we're, we're going to continue to try to get that word out. In uh, 1988, my sister and I became business partners. It was at this time that we started to advertise Nina Dairy Queens. So we dropped the Terry's Dairy Queen and we dropped the Archie's Dairy Queen and we started calling it Nina Dairy Queens. She was the sole owner in 1995. We petitioned the city in 1996 to close the Olive Street corridor between Washington Avenue and Commercial Street with the help of future Nina. Here again, all these relationships. Randy Stad Miller uh, helped be the mediator between the city, Dairy Queen, and myself. Uh, Blizzard Coin. Quickest one. Where did Randy have his first job? There you go. Yeah, he worked for Dad. That Dad uh, was his first employer. So in 1998, we were able to put on the uh, drive-through at the business. International Dairy Queen wanted us to move. They wanted us to go to Menasha, but I didn't want to go. And really, what Randy convinced them of is that uh, they might as well deal with me versus somebody else on that corner. And that's really why that whole thing happened, is that the city was like, well, if we, who else is going to want that corner? <laughs> Who's going to want that triangle? So I did. So I'm glad that we're there. Lenny Mathias would always call Dad after every remodel and say, Arch, can I stop by for a tour? He used, that was just one of the things. He was such a, a proud guy. He really thought that uh, Dairy Queen was just the coolest, and he still wanted to be a part of that. It was at this time that Lenny's granddaughters, Emily and Brooke, were employed at Dairy Queen. So these were Steve's daughters. So now here again, we have everything coming full circle again at the Dairy Queen. Lenny was a proud grandfather and past EQ owner. In 2001, Archie and Betty were part of the live mannequin event. <laughs> and John and Peg, their good friends, came down to support them. Their relationship continued uh, as they visited mom in assisted living. Peg, you were one of mom's best cheerleaders. <laughs> So what were some of the other community events? Because some people said, you know, what were some of these? Um, Mary Jane didn't want me to mention her name, <laughs> but uh, she was always that little force in my ear. Jim, you think you could do one more for the city? One more for the city. So we built uh, a cake for community fest that served 400 people. We built three banana splits over the year. The last one that we built was 150 feet. <laughs> And uh, before the fireworks, we served a 1,000 uh, spectators that evening. We're the national sponsors of Children's Hospital. Um, that's kind of our mission um, as a store. We, have we had cow milking contests during the farmer's market. Uh, we pass out DQ dishes at the farmer's market during the June Dairy Month or July National Ice Cream Month. <laughs> That's worth it. <laughs> what was that? Who was it? I'm sorry, what was that? The cow milking contest. Oh, oh you, you enjoyed that? No, that takes a lot of pull. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, we had some pretty good celebrities uh, doing that. Uh, also in the, 90, in the 90s and the 2000s, uh, my sister and I were fortunate enough to have our own children work for us. Uh, I was such a proud dad to have those uh, three boys uh, working alongside me. Uh, they had some of the greatest memories of their, what they called Opa. They called, my, they called Archie Opa. And I would always tell dad, dad, relax. Just be grandpa when you're here. And that's what he did. And they have, when those kids get together, they, they constantly are going back and forth with Opa stories and what happened in the back of Dairy Queen. <laughs> So 
I'm not sure if Jim wants me to tell this story, but I'll tell it anyway. Um, there was a while that I was the salesperson, Archie, so he was my first employer, and then later on I sold him ice cream mix before I moved higher up in management of the company. And uh, we had come out, uh, we were getting rid of the 10-gallon milk can that we delivered the Dairy Queens in, and guys like Archie loved a 10-gallon milk can. I can pick that up with one hand, you know, it's only 110 pounds. Well, you know, any man can do that. Well, he has a lot of women working in the store, so this probably wasn't a good long-term future. So we were switching to plastic bags and a plastic case. Over my dead body is kind of Archie's response to that. But finally he acquiesced, and I remember sort of living at the store for a week, converting him from the cans to learn how to use the bags and that, and um, we finally got it done. Uh, his counterpart up in Appleton, Merlin, was even feistier about this, and I finally had to wait till Merlin went on vacation, and I did it the week that he was gone. <laughs> the other thing about Archie is that later on I even went to I think probably the only Dairy Queen convention I went to because then I went into the other side of the business. And um, we were down at Pat O'Brien's in New Orleans, a bunch of Dairy Queeners, and there was, there was maybe a hurricane, one for the table. <laughs> a lot of straws, though. And, um, big hurricane. Big hurricane. And uh, Archie was, was, was a man who had a lot of hair, a lot of it on his chest. And, one of his favorite tricks was, have you ever seen a guy light his chest hair on fire? <laughs> so, um, I found out when Jim came over to work on this presentation that there are some people who have never seen the inside of Galloway Company, like Jim Reiser, which I'm shocked at because he's been in the offices hundreds of times but never in the building. And it is very hard to give tours of Galloway Company because um, it's just complicated. So I'll give you a quick look. Um, that's what we look like today. Um, very, very different. Uh, we purchased an awful lot of land around us. Um, and today we looked at uh, purchasing quite a bit more mm -hmm. behind us towards Harrison Street um, because we, we have to expand again. Um, I just want to note that that big white building in the upper right hand corner, that is where we now unload sugar indoors. We used to do it outdoors. Our neighbors used to hate us, and for good reason, because you have to put a vibrator on the side of the car and shake the car to have the sugar fall out, particularly during the winter. And uh, now it's done indoors, and the bees aren't there anymore either, so the employees <laughs> like it, and it's not raining. <laughs> and when it's 25 below out, they like it. So, um, And then the row of windows is the new offices. We moved from very, very small offices, um, and we're out of room already. Um, this is a history wall. All the employees, management, production, go into the same lobby. And this is what they see. They see the history of Galloway Company on the wall, and they can hopefully absorb it as they go on. Um, this is just one of the processing units we have in the plant. This is a reverse osmosis to get rid of some water from the skim milk. Um, it's one of the few reverse osmosis skim units in the country, and we've had it in for 15 years. <coughs> this is a brand new piece of equipment we just installed in the past year, and it's, uh, it's an aseptic uh, filler, or it, it, we're using it for extended shelf life, but uh, dramatically improved the quality of our product. Um, that one came, I believe, from Italy. Um, this is a bad picture, but it's a brand new uh, million dollar automatic pail filler. And uh, just a wonderful piece of equipment. Just a picture of a bunch of really big tanks. We have lots of them. There are about 50 tanks inside the plant, plus the ones you see on the outside. This is just showing some of the complexity of what people have to hook up just to make the job just to do the work at the company. And they have to know how to make those connections. We've tried to make it a bit easier. We've started putting in a lot of automatic valve clusters. Um, here's the inside of that big building for the sugar. 
Um, that's a picture of our evaporator. It is still the state-of-the-art evaporator in the world to make sweet and condensed milk. Um, plumber's nightmare. <laughs> we don't make anything but stainless steel. It's just everywhere. Um, and another view of the complexity of it. This is where we make ice cream mix. When we give the rare time we give tours, this is where everyone stops. Why? It's the only place you see milk in the entire dairy. Because <laughs> it's going into the plastic bags and it goes really fast and they like to see, they just stare at it, wow, that's fast, yeah. <laughs> um, and you're not a real manufacturing plant until you have a robot. So this is our robot to stack uh, cases onto pallets. Jim? In 2002, Dad was 77. Dad officially retired uh, from working at Dairy Queen because of medical conditions prevent him from continuing to do his job, which was making delis. I, I don't think I have enough tokens, but um, the amount of deli bars that my dad made, all made by hand. We estimate he made over two million deli bars. That little deli wagon, I was the Dilly Dipper when that was around. <laughs> Way back then, we were only a seasonal business. We did 100,000 Dilly Bars back then. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. 10,000 10, back there? Okay. Okay. In 2007, my business hero passed away. In 2011, my personal hero passed away. I didn't know my dad or understand him until I, I bought the store. We shared a lot of time together. Remember, he was working all the time. I really didn't get to know my dad, but uh, he became my business hero. My mom, she was my personal hero. You know, she helped me fix my bike. She could sew buttons on me, she could mend my socks, um, and she became uh, one of my business cheerleaders in the future. Also in 19, or 2011, my sister semi-retired, and her son Sean took the reins of the Dairy Queen West. He completed the grill and chill remodel. In 2007, another generational start happens. Sophia, Eric, and Anaway, Annika Galloway, uh, join the DQ team. As Dilly Dippers counter clerks at Dairy Queen, it continued the pride in the dairy indus industry and it came full circle. So those are Tim's children that work for me. In 1992, my sister delivered a very important message to me. I was looking for my business purpose in life. She said to me, I see the way you train and care about your young employees. I see you as being a prideful person with the princesses and princesses of the king. I walked away with my new mission statement. You know, I, I really love and appreciate these young kids in our community. I hope I can get through this. They, are, they have so much to offer. But you have to ask. I mean, you really have to ask them. Don't expect them to know. They have way more pride in themselves than you realize. We need to create a safe work environment for these young people so they can act out who they want to be. A place where no gossip or criticism is, because that's a cancer. That will shut down any young spirit. I'm pretty easygoing. There are only a few things that ruffle my hair on the back of my neck. And one of them is when a customer complaint comes in. We make mistakes. We know that. We deal with customer complaints. We don't have a lot of them, do we, Amy or Jason? We're very fortunate that way. We've got a lot of checks and balances. <clears throat> but when that customer comes in and they start to bully one of my young employees, that raises my hair up. 
My young employees feel bad enough about making the mistake. They don't need any help feeling any worse than they already do. Those young people that made your cones, blizzards, and popcorn are now making sure our communities are safe in all walks of life. And some of them have become moms and dads. And now their children have come to want the same thing that their, their parents had. And the parents want them to come and work at Dairy Queen. This is one of the greatest compliments that I get from the community. And Steve and I just echo that, that uh, when our kids were looking for a place to work, um, it was not a choice. <laughs> if Jim offers you a job, you're going to work for Jim. <laughs> because you will get the most training, you will learn how to work hard, you will learn honesty, and you will learn how to serve the customer. And I will tell you that the greatest lesson that Archie ever taught me, I'm probably of the last generation who knows how to count change. <laughs> <laughs> It's a lost skill, and I can do it without looking at my iPhone. I really can. <laughs> um, no, uh, my son Eric uh, wanted to be a dilly dipper from the moment his older sister uh, joined the firm, and that's great. But you know, family is important. It's important to Jim. It's very important to us. I see some employees or spouses and employees in this room and some of them have had sons and nephews and cousins. We have so many families working at Galloway Company. Um, three brothers are working there right now. It, it, it is incredible and we hope that's because what we're doing resonates with them and they find that to be a good place to work. Um, Galloway Company will continue to change. I stopped being president in 2000. I didn't want to go backwards, so I became a CEO. <laughs> Before I retire in the next few years, I'm going to find out what a CEO does, <laughs> so I can do it. Um, but it has allowed us something important. We've actually put non-family members as president of the company, and our company has been so much better because of it. We don't know. This is the kind of the closing, what, what the future is at Galloway Company. I don't know if there's going to be a fourth generation uh, running that business. My daughters don't seem interested right now. They have passions in other areas. And I'm a firm believer, if you don't have passion, don't do the work. Because it's not fair to the other people, and ultimately it's not fair to you. Um, my son Eric might. He's working in business now. Uh, if he's out of college, and maybe he'll come back, but he has to do his own thing first. And that was his choice. Um, but we're set up for this to be a family-owned business, giving back to the community and providing meaningful employment for generations to come. Doesn't mean we have to work there, but we want to make sure that that corporate headquarters, those type of jobs, those very well-paying Teamster jobs. And you know, a lot of my business friends say, well, what are you doing to get rid of the union? Absolutely nothing. If they want to be in the union, fine. Someone's got to settle disputes. I'm happy to let the union rep do it. <laughs> but they're good paying jobs. And they provide um, uh, uh, satisfaction to them and security for the future. And we're very big into security. So Galloway Company is going to be there. There's going to be no Dean Foon side on it. There's going to be no Kraft or anyone else. It's going to be a, a business owned by people who live and work right here for generations to come. So that's the future Galloway Company. Jim's got some other plans. <laughs> I do. In uh, 2015, we completed the latest uh, remodel of the Dairy Queen. This picture here is the, the last day before the remodel. So this is um, Amy in the middle, Amy um, Zelinsky 
uh, Gruz, Jason Kozlowski, and uh, myself. Ready? Yeah, you can flip it. So that's the inside and the new exterior of the store. In 2010, after 30 years in business, I met with my accountant and my financial planner. We talked about our exit strategies. I walked out that day with a plan in my head. In 2013, I contacted International Dairy Queen. We need to make some contractual changes. The reason is, is that all of our non-systems food, so that little Dairy Queen on the corner that had popcorn and hot beef sandwiches and barbecue and turkey, ham and cheese soups in the, in the uh, winter season, um, I would be able to transfer that and sell it to the new owners. But they wouldn't be able to transfer it. That's where it was going to die. And I didn't feel that was very fair. So we had to work on that part of it. In uh, 2014, Christine and I sat down. And we sat down with uh, Jason Kozlowski and Amy Gruz, and, they, and I asked them if they wanted to become our new business partners and the new owners of Dairy Queen in the future. Well, I see a smile back there. <laughs> they said yes, and we were excited about that. One of the things that was really important to me was, who's going to take over? Like Tim, my three boys' passions, they're, they're in other places. You know, we told them to go chase their dreams. Well, they did. One's in Alaska, one's in Montana. <laughs> Our closest one's in the Twin Cities. But they all have loves and passions for other things. So it was really important to us to make sure that we were going to leave this business in the hand of community members. We didn't want it to sell it to the highest bidder where they would come in. It would be store number 13. They'd put a management team in there. They'd see what they could get out of the community, and they wouldn't <laughs> give back. And I want to live here, and I don't think I could look at that. I really don't. So that's why we came up with this new business plan. But in, in 2015, we still had new, no new contract. Pretty frustrating, wasn't it? They keep coming in, you hear anything, you hear anything, any new offers. Well, I got real frustrated. So I contacted another relationship, another community leader in the community. I think you people probably all know him. He uh, runs a lot of franchises and a lot of car dealerships. <laughs> and, I, and I called him up and I told him my situation. And it was, a, it was a wonderful conversation. But the last thing that he told me, and someday I'll, one on one I'll share with what, what happened in that. But what he ended up telling me is that when you open the doors up on that communication room that you were just in, you all walk out pals. And you make sure that they know the target that you're after. Three months later, we got our contract. <laughs> so, you know, I, I was scared. And I was told, get out of your comfort zone. Because I was dealing with a large corporation. Why do I share that story? Because of the relationships. Not because of the people that were connected to it, but all of those relationships are available to you and your next generation, your children. It's here, this community offers so many things. Look at this room, it's, it's busting at the seams. You know, there's, there's a community story that's being told here. I'm surprised that this room is this full. And I think maybe that's why my voice just keeps jumping up and down. This is exciting. This is really cool. Normally you can't get me to shut my mouth at my store. This is, this is just a very neat experience. So we got our contract. Um, one of the other things that uh, was really important is that we had something to give because we wanted to get something from Dairy Queen. So one of the things that I was instructed, you're not going to get everything you want. 
So we were fortunate enough. We had to give up all those things, and we were able to keep two of our most popular items, and that was Archie's Famous Popcorn and the Homemade Hot Beef Sandwiches. And the reason that I tell you that story is that so many people came into the store after we remodel, and they were disappointed. They're like, where's my favorite sandwich? You know, what about my hot soups? Where'd your red roof go? <laughs> yeah, the red roof was there for 41 years. Even my own son, uh, my middle son, when he came home, he goes, Mom, there's no red roof. He didn't want to see any pictures. <laughs> he just heard how cool it was. So uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was a venture, but I'm telling you, we did this for the future. So what happened there, please don't take personal. You know, it was, I know it might have been your favorite, but the popcorn is everybody's favorite. <laughs> and the homemade hot beef sandwich is still our number one seller. So we're really glad to uh, be able to keep those. finish up here because there's one more relationship I couldn't have accomplished this alone she's my best friend Christine she trusted me she wasn't still as a great mom to all three boys She makes me look good on a dance floor. <laughs> Guess what I'm doing this weekend? We're, we're going to have a dance on a dance floor. She writes the most thoughtful notes of anybody that I know. She's such a thoughtful person. Yesterday when I got home from work, guess what was on my vanity in the bathroom? A note saying, I'll be there to support you. Thank you for the support, Christine. Thank you for supporting all my dreams. I think if you were to ask our three boys um, who their hero is, I think the arrow would be pointing pretty high to you, Christine. <laughs> I guess they're just a chip off the old block. <laughs> Thank you. It has been a real neat journey to be with Jim as a co-worker, as a customer, and much more so as a mentor and uh, to my kids, to our kids, and as a friend. So um, it's great to be here and uh, thank you very much and we'll take questions. <laughs> to make frequent trips to Key West. One night my kids wanted lemon pie. A key lime one. I went into this little bakery. Here stands a big milk can from Nina, Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> it surprised me. Um, we are fortunate to distribute uh, our sweet condensed milk all over Florida. We you know, it's boastful, but we kind of own that market. <laughs> and it's a great bit of business for the snowbirds. <laughs> yes? You mentioned you use milk from local dairies. Uh, how far away from Nina do you go to collect milk? Uh, mostly within 100 miles, but one of our largest uh, dairies supplying us. We do not buy milk directly from farmers anymore. We used to do that. Uh, in the early years, but by the mid-90s, we now buy it from a number of co-ops. And Wisconsin is blessed to have a number of co-ops, so we have choice on who we buy from, and people are, are wanting our business. Lots of other parts of the country, they don't have that privilege. But um, we have a, a, some very large farms in the Upper Peninsula, and they find our market to be very attractive to even bring it down that far. 
No, no. Actually, um, no, uh, back in the day when we were door to door dairy, we did have, um, we made eggnog. Not holiday knock. Holiday knock should not be sold. Um, but eggnog. And um, uh, during the holidays, we do make eggnog for family and friends and pass it out, but we are not a grade A dairy that can sell a retail dairy product. Everything we make has to be further processed. So we are not allowed to go to uh, retail with that the way we're currently permitted. But, and it doesn't have alcohol in it. You have to add your own. <laughs> How much of the Dairy Queen International does Galloway supply? Yeah. We're, we're a regional supplier. Dairy Queen has, in the United States, has 40, 4,600 stores about in the United States, and we only supply a couple hundred. Um, we're Wisconsin, the majority of Wisconsin, the UP, and some in Illinois, down into central Illinois. Uh, but Dairy Queen has 32 manufacturers making their product uh, nationwide. Um, that, that product, it's the best product in the country. I'm an ice cream snob, <laughs> and I'm here to tell you I've been to enough Dairy Queen conventions all over this country, including Hawaii, and uh, the best tasting Dairy Queen comes right from this community. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that just because my friend is standing here. I'm, I'm telling you that because I'm glad to be able to serve that to you too. So the best, the best ice cream tasting Dairy Queen is right here. In Nina. Oh, I wondered how long Dairy Queen, the whole organization. I'm not from Wisconsin, as you can tell. I, how, when did they first start Dairy Queen? 1940. Oh, okay. So they weren't even allowed. I don't. When do you know when the licensing came through from the state? Oh, must have been in 50 or so. Because no, in 40. Oh. When we were finally licensed to uh, have the uh, ice milk products sold here, and I think it was like in '45, maybe even maybe even '46, because I know we're Nina's like one of the first freezer agreements to land in the state. It might be the first one. You know, I I've asked, and since it's contractual, I don't get privy to those those numbers. So I saw a hand back there. When did Dairy Queen stop doing the free Dilly Bar sticks? When did they stop? Let, can we ask Amy? I think this is a great question for you. We haven't stopped. One in 15 is free. Please don't tell the government that you're gambling at Dairy Queen. <laughs> Yeah, when, when they were thinking about going into Douglas Park, um, that probably, it, it's probably a good thing um, because with as few people who use the park now, we would never want anyone to know that next to the park are several very large tanks full of alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> that, th those are the ones with barbed wire around them. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> I've never, that's the first I've, I've ever heard. heard. No. 
Is it the, the original, the Oneida Street store or the Richmond Street store? Richmond. So that's the second store that they built then, was the one up on Richmond Street. Yeah. Yes? In what year did you put the microscope on the glass bottle? I wasn't born yet, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> it, was in, it was in the 40s. Yeah, I would, I would imagine it was, and uh, uh, you know, we're not big into, uh, we have no marketing people on our staff. I mean, Pat and, and Ted and I laugh about this all the time. The marketing budget at Galloway Company is just about that big. <laughs> um, because we're industrial B2B, but we do try and get creative, and so we came up with that logo with the shield in that. So if you notice our new logo, because we tend to reinvent periodically, uh, and that's been around for 20 years now, um, recreates that same kind of thing. There's a shield with a G on the inside, and uh, then the lines coming out might represent three generations, because there are three sets of lines, and three lines in the G. But I'm not sure when it came out. Yes. How many eggs do you go through in a year? <laughs> I was pretty impressed with that. Yeah, it's it's uh, uh, those large eggs, medium yeah, eggs, extra large eggs. eggs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they all come from Iowa, right? Uh, the, we have several suppliers, but yeah, a lot of our eggs come from Iowa. We go through. Uh, uh, I don't know the exact poundage, but it's a lot of eggs. Yeah. A lot of people don't know custard. That's the only difference. Right? There's custard a federal egg. standard of identity for frozen custard. Frozen custard is, it's really a, a flavor of ice cream. In order to be an ice cream, you have to be 10% butter fat. That's why Dairy Queen at 5% is reduced fat ice cream. Uh, and what frozen custard is, it's an ice cream, 10% butter fat. Then it also has to contain 1.4% egg yolks by weight minimum, and that's what makes it a custard. So it's an ice cream with eggs, and that's what makes it a custard. You can serve the custard many different ways through a saucer machine, a modified continuous machine. Uh, but it's the eggs that make the custard a little bit different. <laughs> and I can tell you that, uh, uh, what was it, two years ago when the avian bird um, uh, happened, um, Galloway Company was very fortunate. We had a primary supplier, but we had developing, we were developing a relationship with a backup supplier. And uh, we had just purchased an awful lot of frozen egg yolks instead of the fresh ones that we normally get. Um, and we had those put away. So we made it through. There are people who um, were making other, uh, if, even if it's not custard, lots of other ice creams have some egg in it. Uh, and they were caught short. And uh, we got lucky. Isn't there yes. something about the milk? Because the limestone, the water that they in our area produce in Wisconsin produce milk, which makes milk. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they didn't teach me that in law school. So. <laughs> but um, the, reason, the reason milk in Wisconsin, some people feel it tastes better, uh, it's probably threefold. One, the, uh, the, the, the climate that we're in. Uh, today was a uh, 30 degree day and Bessie out in the field loves to be in that type of temperature making milk as opposed to Florida. And then you also have good quality water around here. And the good quality of water will lead to better milk. And it's the, the type of feed that the cows eat that will also impart different flavors in the milk. Part of the pro or California has, um, the land is too valuable to raise feed for the animals. Um, so a lot of their feed actually is imported from Washington State, Oregon, um, Utah, Colorado, and trucked into California because strawberries fetch a whole lot more per acre than, than corn for cows, believe me. <laughs> or grapes. Or grapes. Somebody? Yes? In 1952, I was one of your customers, and I came to the store there on Commercial Street. Commercial, yeah. 
Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Do you remember when Kessler's had that little ice cream stand? George and the kid that one was kissing in the gym. Oh, from the uh, funeral home? Yeah, they had a little. I didn't realize that. And I think what most of that? you know. Where was that located? It was right by the field mill home. Right on the corner, kind of like. Are you talking scoop or place? No, there's just, I, they just sold ice cream. I, I'm pretty young. And oh, and the old, uh, maybe where the flower shop was most recently, where Memorial Gardens was, the little gas station. Uh, it was outside. That used to be a gas station. Okay. Yeah, that one's done. Okay. Anyway, I'm sure okay. And I'm sure that most of you know that uh, one of our uh, illustrious uh, businessmen of the community, one of his first businesses was an ice cream shop. It's one of the few that didn't make it. <laughs> Anything else? Jim and friends will be handing you a dilly bar as you exit. <laughs> Actually, I would, I would like the new management team. Um, if they can just, what we'll do is, is Amy's on her way out here. And uh, we had an idea of how many were going to be here, but we had to make a second run. So we have enough dilly bars for everybody. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm going to let Tim say thank you. Thank you, Tim. 